Hello everyone and welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. I'm Sarah Scully and I want to welcome any new followers. We've had a few over the holidays. Welcome back. Um, I hope you all had a nice winter break. It is now the first part of January and it's very cold and gray outside today. So I thought I'd cheer things up a little bit with a fun project that you can do at home. And this one is also a fun one to do with children if you have kids. Um, and that's dye yarn with food coloring. Um, now there are a lot of videos out there on YouTube and I actually encourage you to go explore some of these because there are many different techniques for dyeing with food coloring. A lot more than I'm going to cover in one video. But this one will serve as a basic introduction if you've never done it before. And then you can go out and explore some of these other techniques. Um, and so for this uh, method, you're going to need some yarn to dye, and it does need to be animal fibers of some kind, or protein fibers of some kind. It could be silk, wool, alpaca content, um, any of those are fine. Um, you'll need some food coloring, and I'll talk a little bit more about what kinds of food coloring to use in just a second. Um, you'll need some white vinegar or another acid source. You could try lemon juice. I've never actually tried lemon juice before, but it should work. Um, you could also try citric acid, um, which actually lemon juice has in it, of course. Um, citric acid is often sold in a powder form, and you can buy that from dye supply shops and also um, restaurant supply um, or kitchen supply places. Uh, citric acid is, of course, vitamin C and um, is often used for preserving foods. Um, and all of these things, uh, except for the wool, are food grade, and so I don't have any problem using my own um, regular cooking utensils for this type of dyeing. Normally, I would use a dedicated set of pots and pans and utensils that are just for dyeing if I'm going to use any kind of um, wild plant-based dye or if I'm going to dye with a chemical commercial dye, um, because you really shouldn't ingest things like alum and um, commercial acid dyes, and those residues can linger on the utensils that you use. But as I said, for this, um, because we're using a food grade dye, I don't have any problems using whatever measuring cups, utensils, spoons that I have in my kitchen. So the method for this is pretty straightforward. I'll put a complete step-by-step um, -step instructions in the show notes and link that down below at the bottom of this video. But what you'll need, um, like I said, to get started is just, you also need a few containers, um, heat-proof containers. I like to use glass containers. I can um, see what I'm doing. I can see that the dye is uptaking. If I want to be precise about how much water I'm using, I can use the... Um, graduations on the glass measuring cups to do that. Um, and glass is also very easy to clean up. It's easy to get excess dye off of the glass and see that it's clean once you're finished. Um, like I said, you might not um, have a problem with using food dye um, and then you know going to make food afterwards, but you probably don't want to dye your spaghetti or whatever it is <laughs> um, a wild color by accident. So uh, glass is just easier to clean up than other surfaces. So to start, um, you will soak out your yarn in warm water. You want to make sure that the yarn is thoroughly wet. So you want to soak it for at least 15 to 20 minutes before you get started with dyeing. While the yarn's soaking in warm water, you um, can mix up your dyes. And you can blend, of course, any colors you'd like. You can get very creative with this process. Um, but be careful about adding too many different colors. Um, together because if you were to add a whole bunch of different colors together you'd probably get sort of a muddy khaki color or brown um, or something like that that just won't be very attractive. So um, for this experiment, um, and this was an experiment for me today, I wasn't sure exactly what results I'd get, um, I used a pink uh, solid food coloring powdered form and then I also used a liquid uh, a combination of liquid and powdered blue and um, I, I made two batches of dye and then I dipped each end of the skein in a different batch and to get a sort of a self-striping sock yarn um, as well as a blend of the blue and the pink in the middle of the skein at least that was my goal 
So the, the goal was to blend from pink through to sort of a purpley color and into the darker blue. Um, now I also used a couple of drops of a black dye to intensify the blue. I also wanted to um, have my dyes be different in density or intensity um, in addition to be, being different colors. So I wanted the pink to be light and I wanted it to go into a very dark blue. So the black cake dye, um, a few drops of that added to the blue intensified and deepened that color. Um, now black dye you have to be a little bit careful with. You might try um, a drop of black food coloring in water and then dip a paper towel into it, a white paper towel. Um, that will kind of show you what the underlying tone of that black dye is. Black cake dye especially is not really black. Um, they achieve the effect by either making a very, very dark green or very, very dark blue. Um, and so knowing what tone that black has will um, help inform what it will do to, to other colors if you add that black to other tones. So if, if that black has a green tinge to it, for example, and you were to add it to a red, uh, a brighter red color, you might have some hints of brown underneath um, because you're combining all the colors at that point, blue and yellow for the green black dye and then the, um, the red for your vibrant color. You might get kind of a murky red or a, a bricky red um, if you were to add a green tinted black dye to that. Whereas if you added a blue based black dye, for example, to um, a yellow to intensify that yellow color, it would also greenify that yellow, right? It would, it would change the shade. So just knowing what your black dye is sort of made up of um, can help you decide how to pair it with other colors or, or whether to use it with other colors. Um, now I mentioned uh, in my introduction that I was gonna talk about different kinds of dye. So you can get dyes in different forms. Probably the most familiar is in the cake aisle at any major grocery store and this is a very liquid form of dye. Um, I'm not even you know particular about the brand on any of these just just the form. So these come in these bottles and you can see they're very diluted. Um, so now you would have to use quite a bit of this kind of dye to achieve a dark color. Um, and in fact when I was dyeing today I used an entire bottle of this liquid dye with some powdered dye and some gel to achieve a darker color. So these are readily accessible, but they're going to make very vibrant bright colors, um, not the dark shades that you can get with a more concentrated dye stuff. So the next most concentrated looks similar, but usually you would have to go to a specialty cake store um, or go to an online supplier. This is Americolor, the gel paste, and as the name suggests, this is a much thicker liquid dye. It's not, um, I can't even show you really, but it's, it's not as diluted as the other um, more readily available food coloring. It's a bit thicker, and so it's a bit more potent. Um, usually, um, like this one came with eight colors originally, those kit, Usually these gels and the solids come in a wider range of colors. So in your basic grocery store kit, you're gonna get the primary colors that you can mix. In these, you're gonna get some more shades that you can use right out of the bottle or also blend together. Um, for example, this kit came with the black that I have. It came with a chocolate brown. Um, so I don't have to make these colors up. I can just use them out of the bottle. And then the last form is the most concentrated, and that is these little powdered um, containers that I showed you a minute ago. And it may be hard to see in there. I'll try not to get powdered dye all over my computer, but you can see they're in a the powder form. So these are super concentrated. I like cooking with these because if you're making something like an icing or a frosting, you're not adding liquid to your frosting, and so you're not changing the consistency of your frosting when you're baking with it. And I like dyeing with them because they're very shelf stable. They last a long time. They're not gonna get all goopy or weird in their bottle sitting on the shelf. And um, 
you know, like, like I said, they're super concentrated. And again, you might get multiple shades in your kit of solid food coloring. For example, this one had two shades of red, two shades of green, and um, several other interesting shades to play with. So, and that were different than the gel pack that I got. So between these two, I really had a lot of options at my disposal. So like I said, for this experiment, I wanted to use a blue and a pink and dip each end of the skein into those and then hopefully get kind of a purple shade as they blend it together. Um, it wasn't as easy to get the dyes to blend on their own as I was hoping it was or would be. So I really had to use a spoon and kind of coax um, and pour over the dye bath on the skein while it was soaking. And then eventually I still had some like a, a distinct white band between the two colors and so I ended up just dipping part of the pink section. I pulled it out of that um, jar and dunked it into the, the blue to really soak up. I wanted to make sure I didn't have any white spots in the skein. I was also very careful about which shades of these colors that I was blending together. Again, if you use too many different shades, you're going to make mud. So I knew I had the blue and I wanted to choose a blue based pink. So between these two shades of red in my solid color kit, I wanted to pick the cherry pink rather than what they call Christmas red, which is more of a brick color and definitely has some orange and orangey yellow tones in it. So yellow plus red plus blue, you're going to get brown. Whereas a blue based pink, which is just red with a little bit of blue in it, combined with that other stronger blue, you know, you're going to get purple without a lot of muddy colors. Um, you also want to make sure when you're using these solid dyes that you thoroughly mix them before you put the yarn into the dye bath. You thoroughly dissolve the granules because they can really stick together and especially if they've been sitting on the shelf for a while um, it can really clump up. It helps to actually shake this little vial and kind of break up the the powder but just be careful when you open it because you're going to get more dust if you've shaken it up ahead of time. I like to start with a couple tablespoons of very hot water out of my electric kettle mix those into a paste and then add a little bit more water and really thoroughly dissolve the dye before adding the rest of the hot water. I also like to add my vinegar directly to my dye bath rather than soaking my yarn in vinegar beforehand. Um, vinegar or citric acid, if you're using that, is gonna act as your mordant, which will help the dye bind onto the fibers of the yarn. And you do need some kind of acid to help this reaction along. The Either the dye won't take up or it won't permanently adhere to the yarn if you don't use an acid to help it. So the two factors that help the dye bind permanently onto the wool are the acid and the heat. So you're going to use hot water. Again, I use an electric kettle to boil water. And then I wait for it to cool down just a little bit. I don't want to put boiling water onto my yarn, but I do want the water to be very hot. And obviously, if you're doing this with children, you just want to make sure that you're there to supervise or to help them pour the hot water. Um, but yeah, once you do that, then you just let the yarn sit in the hot water dye bath with the acid um, for a while. And I really like to let it sit overnight. Um, that can be a little frustrating, especially again for children or people with short attention spans like myself. Um, <laughs> or people who are impatient, I guess I should say. I don't have a short attention span, but I, I like to see the results right away. And so, um, but if you don't let the yarn sit and really help the chemical reaction and the binding process finish, you'll find that a lot of your dye will wash out when you go to rinse it at the end. So let it sit in the, in the dye bath for at least a few hours until it's cooled down completely. You can check the process by dipping a clean spoon into the dye bath. And if you don't see the color in the spoon, then you know that the dye has absorbed from the water onto the yarn and it is you know, adhering pretty well. Um, 
sometimes it can be hard to see whether that has really finished until you go to rinse your yarn. And again, if you have a lot of um, dye water coming out when you're rinsing your yarn, what I would do is put it back into some warm water with some more vinegar at that point and just let it sit overnight until that reaction can finish. That way you're not going to rinse out all of your color when you wash your skein. Um, now once your dye has stabilized and taken up, you're going to rinse your skein in warm water. You can use wool wash or a drop of dish detergent at this point. I usually don't. Um, it's another thing to spend money on basically. I almost never use wool wash. I just wash my yarns or my woolens in water. Um, but you can do that especially if you you know, want to make your yarn smell like nice. Um, some of those wool washes are scented as well. And then you're going to let your, um, you're going to squeeze the yarn. You don't want to wring the skein out and twist the fibers and pull all of them while, while they're wet, but you can kind of gather the whole thing up and squeeze it in your, in your hands and get a lot of the water out. And then I just like to hang up the yarn. You know, if it's nice outside, obviously you can hang it on a line to dry, but um, it's, it's really cold and actually blowing snow here today. So um, I would just let it drip dry in the shower. It might take a couple of days to completely dry. Um, but after that, then you can work with it, knit with it. If you've done a good job and, a, and been patient about letting the dye really adhere to the yarn, um, you shouldn't get any residue on your hands when you're working with the yarn. And again, if you do, then you know for next time, soak it in the vinegar, leave it in the dye bath overnight, be a little bit more patient with it. Um, you can also add a little bit more acid or reheat the dye bath, dye bath in the microwave or on the stovetop gently um, if, if you need to use heat and acid to get that dye to really stick onto the yarn. Um, now, like I said, in my experiment for today's video, I did a double dip, a simultaneous double dip to get sort, sort of a variegated yarn, um, a color changing yarn. I also noticed that in my blue section, I didn't have enough dye, as, enough, as much dye as I'd like. So I ended up adding more dye after the yarn went in, and that created kind of a, a blotchy, variegated effect in that blue section. So I knew that I knew that adding dye after the fact would create this blotchy effect because what happens is as soon as the dye touches part of the yarn, it will bond onto it. And so if you haven't diluted your dye before adding it to the dye bath, you're more likely to get these kind of splotchy effects. Now, sometimes that can be what you're going for, but it is something to be careful of if you're starting out and you're trying to get a more solid color. Um, I would say that if you put your yarn in to the dye bath and leave it for an hour and come back and check in and you feel like it's not dark enough, I would take the wring the yarn out, take it out of the dye bath, and then put more dye in and maybe some more vinegar, and then reintroduce the yarn after that dye is thoroughly mixed. If you dump the dye onto the yarn like I did, then you're going to get that variegated kind of splotchy effect. Um, you can also do things like add the powdered dye right onto the wet yarn. Um, you can put this into a little shaker and sprinkle it on, and that's one way to get speckles. Um, speckled yarn uh, came about a couple of years ago, I feel like, um, but the trend has still been really hot. And so if you want to make your own speckled yarn with a, sort of a, a very light background color or even a white yarn, with little tiny speckles on it, that's how, how you could do it. You can sprinkle on um, the powdered dye directly onto the wet yarn, and that would create your little speckles. Um, you can also do things like gradients. So again, you have to be careful about mixing colors together and getting weird brown tones, but here's one that I picked out of my solid dye set. These are colors it came with. So if I were to dye the first third of the skein with this yellow and then the middle part with this they call it leaf green but it's a light spring green and then finish off with this emerald green you can get a gradient and you would get an interesting blend between these colors that I think would be very complementary. Um, 
So that's one way to do gradients. And if you want to keep your colors on the yarn, you can also soak out the yarn, put um, concentrated, uh, soak out the yarn, wet it out, put it onto a piece of plastic wrap, put your dye onto the yarn, and then roll it up in the plastic wrap, and either put that in a slow cooker or put it into the microwave um, for a short cooking time to kind of heat it up and make sure the dye is sticking onto it. So that's one way to control color and placement of color um, if you're not going to soak the yarn into a vat or a, a dish like I did. Like I said, there are a lot of other videos. Um, there are also little dye tablets you can buy. I think they're usually used for dyeing Easter eggs, but you can take the tablets and tuck, tuck them into a skein or a cake of yarn and then they'll do all kinds of you know, interesting stuff while they're inside this ball of yarn. And then once you unwrap the ball is when you sort of can see the results. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting techniques for using food coloring, um, Easter egg dye, cake dye, to, to dye yarn at home. And I encourage you to try some of these. Again, I'll link to some other videos that I found that were intriguing and you can try your hand and see what you come up with. I'd love to see the results. Thanks again for watching and tune in next week for more crafty tips.